so I'm just going to make some rather superficial comments to pick up some themes that were raised by Andrew uh, and Scott and also Jay, um, just to do a little bit of wrapping around kind of a portfolio view of all of the narrative works. Um, so I think this is a reminder if you like. And we'll have time for, um, I should be able to finish in five minutes, we'll have at least five minutes of questions, how about that? Which will be more interesting, I think. But let, let me take you through this just kind of quickly again. Um, so this slide shows, uh, if you look at the S1 column, um, you can see they're ordered by rank order. This is a slide Andrew put up. Um, China-Japan conflict at the top, 17 trillion. That's one we haven't described here. It's a serious war that doesn't become global, but you can imagine how that would cause. Compare that, um, for some reason, there's a white blob at the bottom, but that 20 at the bottom is um, five years' worth of GDP damage done in 2014 by the equivalent of the global financial crisis. So that gives you the kind of scale. And as mentioned previously, global property crash is the propensity for the greatest damage. Um, followed by the Eurozone meltdown, high inflation world and dollar deposed are a little bit more muted. Um, it's not so surprising that dollar deposed causes a smaller amount of damage because after all, the global currency shift is an indicator of economic damage per se. What you're really looking at there is a transition costs more than long term economic <coughs> damage. Um, this is a quick reminder of the, of the four portfolios that we looked at. Um, the high quality one tends to be heavy in bonds. It tends to be heavy in um, US, uh, um, British, European, with a bit of Japanese thrown in, for example. Aggressive, heavier in equities. Um, uh, what else can I say? The geographic split isn't, isn't that much different. It's got a lot of, of US um, in it, in terms of financial instruments. Um, now, if I put everything on the one chart, Andrew showed a similar chart, I think. Um, this is a max downturn chart. Um, we can see across the top the four different scenarios. And in the different colors, you can see the four different um, reactions for each one of the different kinds of portfolios. So if I make um, two observations, one is that in most of these scenarios, it appears that you lose less. These are all losing scenarios. Okay? You lose less if you're in the kind of blue chip uh, you know, American bonds, that's it. That would be the message. So um, if you were a standard fund manager, you'd say, well, yeah, we knew that all along. So that, that's one thing, except for the high inflation one, um, where naturally enough, um, holding US bonds with inflation going through the roof, um, interest rates going crazy, and all the rest of it, you might have an inkling that holding US bonds may not be such a great idea. Which is why um, this, is, this is the one where an aggressive portfolio where your equities are really trying to keep pace with inflation. That's what I think of it. Maybe that kind of makes sense. But so, so far, not much information here. It's what we've seen already, and it's what you'd expect. And then I come to Jay's point. Jay said, hmm, what does this tell us? Maybe we're missing something. Maybe what we're missing here is that there's an over-reliance on US denominated securities. Maybe that's what's going on. And if you go back to these, th these are all old, they're basically an old world portfolio that you're looking at, developed market. So what we're really coming to is what's blindingly obvious that um, in many of these scenarios, when you think about them, holding what we know in established markets is not going to save you. Um, now I can just kind of repeat that message. Let's just repeat it uh, portfolio type by portfolio type. And of course, we could go through, we could go through it as a real environment, asset type by asset type. But um, if you had a crystal ball, and you would say, um, and I knew which one of these was going to occur, which I don't, and maybe some other device that occurred in one of these, I would be thinking of moving away in most of these from an aggressive portfolio to a high quality fixed income portfolio. That's what I said already, uh, except in one case. Uh, and then a reminder again that this is a rather narrow view of the world. Okay, so this is really the same story told again in a different way. Um, so now we're starting to think about um, how can we think a little bit more broadly? What are the tools that we have available to us? And rebalancing was mentioned. So if I just go through some key words here. Um, point one, we're developing rather than the traditional, and I mean five years or more ago, banking stress tests were about um, interest rates changed by so much, or <coughs> my mortgage book gets hit by so much, or something in isolation of every other thing that could happen with the rest of my book or with other banking institutions or indeed the economy. 
So the first thing we're saying with all of these is, um, for goodness sake, do your stress tests as they occur in the real world and you've got to see the connection. So each one of those stress tests is basically a large, unusual, heavy correlation pattern that is not representative of what we think is normal. But they come along in any case, so why don't we actually look at those correlation patterns and try to map them out, and that's what coherency does for us. Um, what does rebalancing rely on? Well, there is a question of timing, and timing's a little bit tricky for us because if you have a very large event, a little bit like a very large earthquake, you might know lots about um, geological formations, you might, might know a lot about um, earthquake physics, uh, and you might know a lot about the distribution of these things, but predicting the big ones is going to be difficult. Okay, so uh, early morning signals and prediction may be, may be tricky to manage. But there's a timing element here, so it should you take action, when should, should you take action, about how much should you take action, and what is the strategy? Um, well in all of our portfolios, we've sort of said, well, let's fix the strategy first. And the strategy will be this percentage of equity, this percentage of bonds, and it will be split across these geographies. And once we fix that strategy, we don't mind rebalancing within that strategy. But perhaps there are other strategies which are dynamic, which we haven't considered. Um, so, uh, if you are actually uh, able to start mixing your instruments around, what would, you, what would you do? If you were, in a certain way, to be a bit more flexible about your strategy, well, you can start moving around, but changing the percentage of, of different asset classes, moving uh, the balance between geographies. And so the picture I'm going to put up next is one that Andrew showed a similar one of. Um, uh, sorry, the last point here is, um, so far we've really talked about um, uh, protecting loss. And we haven't really said very much about growth per se, so that's something that we should keep in the back of our mind. Um, and of course, that conversation involves all the same keywords. So this is a slide that Andrew put up something like this before. If you started with um, the kind of portfolio that we, or the kind of instruments that we had, and you again had a kind of a crystal ball, and you said, well, what would I like to do when the crisis comes? In each case, a global property crash, um, if that's going to hit, um, some of the emerging markets, and it's going to hit European, uh, particularly um, mortgages and retail uh, property, commercial property in the UK. Well, no big surprise that you're going to move out of the UK. The question is, where will you move? Um, you might have some intuition for that, but our analysis is based on what the um, global economic model says. Uh, so again, so most of these are kind of things that you'd expect, but I suppose the caveat again is, um, you'll notice that China just popped up here. Um, maybe we should be thinking a little bit more broadly, including emerging opportunities. Um, you have really the same story here when you're rebalancing in the face of bonds. Uh, there is a, a bit of an issue here, Jay was alluding to it, China really has to develop much deeper um, internal markets that um, external people can access for China to really make a reserve currency shift. So at the moment, their internal money markets are a bit shallow for this and lots of piracy. Um, uh, now, I'd like to leave you with one thought, and it's something that um, I think Andrew um, was t talking about, so I'll kind of say the same thing slightly differently. Uh, we've had a number of conversations um, with different kinds of institutions, sometimes uh, mostly in the financial sector, but I'm only talking about insurance companies, banks, uh, and also hedge funds but also with um, people who do trading in energy, for example. And there's a similar theme, which is, um, what, are the, what are the signs that are precursors of some of the patterns that we notice in extremists? So if we're talking about um, a global inflation or we're talking about a property meltdown, what are the things that accompany that, point one? So could we build a library of events and a library of those early warning triggers? And alongside that, a library of um, reaction or mitigation strategies. And depending on what business you're in, you might be interested in, can I make a, um, a rebalancing, i.e. a killing, in the first um, three minutes to six hours? Um, can I move my portfolio in the first week? Or am I in something which is a bit you know, heavier in terms of contracts and physical goods? Maybe I'm just trying to prevent the worst of the downside and I'll try to do that in six, in six weeks because what I'm looking at are events that carry out, that carry on and develop over six months. So you might have a different time and a different view of doing this, but the message is still the same. So we keep having this repeated conversation, which is, can we not build up a library of events, of things we've seen before, and marry them to current conditions and ask, is such and such starting to look more likely than everything else, all right? And at what point is that a 
trigger for my action. Now, I have to be very careful here because false positives are the real difficulty. Okay, spotting, spotting likely trend is easy. Knowing when to act is always the hard thing. So with that carry in mind, I come back to one thing Andy mentioned at the start. To do this properly, we're back right in the land of probability and you really don't have to use this. Okay. Um, at any rate, there's some three thoughts, very brief overview of the portfolio and a kind of some questions that um, are in line with our thinking about what we might be doing in the future. And one of the projects we're, we're definitely thinking about multiple, dealing with multiple threats at the same time, putting them on the page at the same time for the purposes of risk analysis but also of strategic investment is what we call Project Pandora. It's about looking at not just four, but maybe 25 different classes of threats and maybe several scenarios per threat. We're talking about a lot of different sorts of threats here. Then I'm going to stop. Um, if we could have the four presenters for the four scenarios at the front, and we might just have some questions on any of these particular scenarios because um, we seem to have impassioned discussions often behind closed doors on the pros and cons of scenarios. Which is, are they credible? Are they believable? Are they, um, are they too mild? Are they too severe? And um, I think Jacqueline is expressing some discomfort at being asked to present a global inflation scenario in a world where the oil prices is as low as it's been for a decade or whatever. But um, if you go around the room and ask people what they think the oil price will be in 2017 or 2020, I don't think too many people are betting that it will be below $40 a barrel. Now, I don't know when it will go up, but most of us don't think that's sustainable. So whether or not we're in line for a high inflection world, no one's making that prediction, but to say it will never happen, that's when you know you're in line. <laughs> so um, with that in mind, um, questions? I can get started. It's a question for Ali on the, I think on the Eurozone scenario. Um, the one assumption that I found a bit difficult to understand is we, we said that whenever a country defaults and exits, let's say Italy, and then it's followed by the rest, the knock-on effect on Germany and the core, let's say, from assuming that that was huge, looking by their ratings, right? So Germany went, I think, it went from, from a very high rated to, to double B. Um, what, are, what assumption are we, are we making then, and how is that realistic, rather than just simply writing off the, the debt that it had in? Uh, so what, what we did essentially, um, because we are assuming exit of Euro is also called uh, currency change. For example, Italy goes back to uh, uh, Lira. Yeah, yeah. And as a consequence of that, there is um, devaluation because of that uh, exchange. And basically, because that debt value, for example, if Germany has been lending to Italy, that is, that is um, devalued, so that goes back to that. But obviously, I mean, it could have been more realistic to actually map the uh, actual uh, exposure of these countries to each other. So, I mean, we have actually looked at that as well. I mean, BIS releases data on uh, uh, quarterly basis on these uh, exposures that they have. So, I mean, in that sense, it could have been more realistic looking at that. Yeah. Okay, but I understand. So, Germany is hit because it, how it, have, uh, it holds it, Italian debt now, not because it assumes the Italian debt that is held by other parties, right? Yeah, yeah because of the debt it holds at that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that makes sense. If I just ask a question of Scott, you, you showed one of the historical time series you were looking at was oil price. Don't you think you should have coal in the historical scenarios that you, you had at the table? Uh, it's one of the indexes that we collected. You mean? I don't know if I showed it. Do you talking about referring to live? No, you, said you, you, you had a list of time series that yeah, you were Okay, yeah, yeah. So <coughs> we collected oil because that was um, that was the data that I had to find. There was limited data on coal. So I, I grabbed uh, the relevant data that I could, and there was good data on oil. So that was okay. Just the industrial revolution and so on. Yeah. Driven by coal. Exactly, yeah. I, I would add some of these charts could be best drawn in real terms, maybe, unless they were a bit like you get that. Mm -hmm. The so GDP, GDP graphs, you mean? Well, I think the GDP ones probably were, but uh, yeah. the, 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 the ones where the markets were getting back, you showed a chart where the, it took a long time to. Um, the difference between nominal, you know, 
highly worth just thinking about what the real shock is compared to the nominal shock, because the nominal shock two dollars to eight dollars or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah just, just thinking about how those shocks are I, I, I think on the the historical examples when we shock those and what they would go through, I think they did show those in, in, in real terms and the Wall Street crash. Um, that, that was the largest shock out of all of the scenarios, so perhaps that's why it wasn't recovering back to that, that trend base as quickly as the other CL shocks. But there was a lot of inflation at the time as well. Yeah. So yeah. Question. Who has analysed the impact of the collapse of oil price? We haven't modelled that yet. We've looked at a price increase, but we haven't looked at <coughs> collapse. So, I mean, one other project that we've been working on is the Cities at Risk project. And we look at an oil price shock in that. Um, but that's again an increase in oil prices, but we haven't done a collapse in oil prices. <coughs> Maybe it's something that we could look at in the future. Absolutely, I think there's several suggestions. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of suggestions and ideas about where we go next with what additional scenarios we should look at next year and uh, stuff like that. We would very much welcome any suggestions and uh, dialogue around that. The only thing that's interesting is about the oil price shock is that a winner that loses in, in the oil price, so it's, a, so it's, a, it's a not, not always a zero sum <coughs> yeah. yeah, Just um, for Jackson, the inflation, I mean, I, I don't think you should, we're talking one in a hundred years, and so the rising, well, some of us anyway in the room have lived through 20% inflation. That you were thinking of was, you know, are we talking 200% of what we just, or 800%, which is where the property is? Um, no, of course, what we're, um, what we're developing here in the high inflation world is looking at a global inflation rate of, um, say, more than 10%. So, in the extreme, so I apologize, I should have included a slide on what the global inflation rate was um, after our shock. So it's in the so the S one S two and the X one scenario is in the range of say six to twelve percent of global inflation. So it means that there are some countries, for example, in Germany and uh, China and the UK, has actually an inflation rate, a country inflation rate of definitely more than ten percent. But it's because it's a global inflation, so we are looking at uh, not exactly it's such a high um, hyperinflation of say. Or even an eight hundred percent, for example, in the Venezuela case. So is that just question or not really? Why you all being so cautious? You know, that doesn't sound to me like a one in a hundred. So, so the way that we applied the shocks was through energy and food prices, and, and the yeah, it was a consumer price index that we shot. It wasn't exactly um, wiping out, or rather changing the inflation rate or the global inflation rate, but we wanted to increase the. <coughs> Rising prices from the fundamentals. It's so a commodity what we did, drift. Yes. So right. we basically shocked the commodity prices, right, Keith? And and they sh they were those sh th those commodity prices were shocked in the yeah, like 200, 300 percent. Yes. So I mean, in the model, you'd have to do a great deal to get inflation as high as eight to ten. You must have. We did. We pushed it. We pushed it as hard as we could. That, that, <laughs> that was probably the breaking the point. You have, you have to assume things like central banks lost their minds and lost control of the situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Things like that. Yeah. So we that. that, that. I mean. One of, the, one of the things that is, and I know economists like to say this time is different. <laughs> <laughs> it is different because I don't think the bargaining power of labour, for example, is what it was when I remember inflation in the 70s, in the late 70s, caused increasing these issues. And I don't also think you'd have to look at the oil intensity of the economy that's gone down a lot as well. So the, the, those oil price shocks you had from over in the, in the 70s and 80s received a very bad policy. They were they oil was important then because the industry was twenty percent of the UK economy, for example, and now it's it's twelve percent. But also the policy response was very bad as well. So quite a lot has to happen to get I, I mean I'm surprised if I'm honest that you managed to get German inflation. So I imagine that would cause I imagine you know, even Angela Merkel probably wouldn't win an election with inflation at that point. Well, well done Tim. <laughs> 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 <laughs>